Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk on interpretable machine learning. I am Minajit Nandi. I am a senior data scientist at a company called Rocket Trip. Uh, that's my Twitter handle in case you want to live tweet at me or angry tweet at me during the t this talk. Uh, so let's just get to it. So I guess for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to sort of define interpretability as the ability to explain what your machine learning model is doing based on for some particular outcome. Like you take some input, you got some output, why did you get that output? And this is a sort of recurring problem in machine learning that techniques that really have really high predictive accuracy tend to be harder to interpret. So like neural networks and deep learning, that's where all the hype is right now. Those are very hard to interpret. Like input goes in, it goes through a bunch of matrix convolutions, some number comes out, you don't know why. And also same thing with random forests. There are just a bunch of trees, they're all working together, some input comes in, some answer comes out, and you don't know why. So we're now like really using these black box models. They have really high predictive accuracy, we don't know why they work, they just seem to work. So why is this an issue? Well, there's this really good book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. I have to say that slowly or I'll mess it up. Um, and really she talks about like, some of the dangers of like, how we use algorithmic models and mathematical models in our society. And some of the things that we're currently using statistical and mathematical models for are like whether a prisoner will be released on parole or how long should their sentence be, uh, who gets a loan from a bank, and also, teachers are sort of evaluated on some magic black box model that says you're a good teacher or not based on some teacher evaluation score. And this is a huge issue that these people's face are sort of determined by this like, faceless algorithm that's acting as an arbiter of like, their destiny. And they don't understand what it's doing. They don't understand why this algorithm said, I'm, you're a bad teacher, therefore you deserve to be fired, or you don't deserve to get a credit loan. And this is a huge problem, and that like, these types of models sort of agitate or like perpetuate social inequality. You know, uh, blacks and Hispanics tend to be given longer sentences or they're less likely given uh, loans from banks, things of that nature. It sort of, it, it sort of perpetuates these social inequalities and we don't want that. It's like, think of the keynote this morning. We don't want to be responsible for creating the dystopia. And now there is like a usefulness of interpretability uh, outside of this like social good, social fairness context. You know, sometimes you just want to know what your model is doing. That's like, usually a helpful thing to have. But a lot of this stuff, a lot of this work on interpretability sort of originated this idea of like fairness and equality in our society. So I just want to pay homage to that. So I guess like why does interpretability matter? So if we have interpretable models, what are some benefits we can get from this? And so first of all, we can sort of validate for fairness. We can check and see if disparate um, vulnerable groups are sort of adversely affected by our model. So this is going back to like the prison sentencing thing, where we can see that, oh, hey, blacks and Hispanics are sort of given higher prison sentences. And there's going to be a talk tomorrow. Um, it's called the like, Tricky Business of Not Discriminating. It's going to be talking much more about this topic. It's a very complex topic of like, how do you protect vulnerable classes, and how do you also like, not try to help them and inadvertently backfire. And then also this idea of debugging models. So because like, neural networks and random forests are sort of hard to understand what they're doing, it's really hard to sort of improve them because you don't really understand why it made the error it made. So here's this very famous example here. Uh, am I allowed to walk past here? Am I still on camera? Okay. And this is a classifier. It's basically trying to figure out if a picture of a canine is either a husky or a wolf. And so here we have a picture of a husky that was classified as a wolf. So this is a misclassification. And we want to know why did it think, the class neural net think that this was a wolf? What attributes of this picture made it think it was a wolf? And so what you can do is you can run it through an interpretable model, uh, interpreter, an explainer, uh, and this is one of the lessons I'm going to be talking about. And you can see that why I thought it was a wolf is because of all these patches of snow here. And what turns out, in the training of this neural network, all the pictures of wolves were in Arctic or snowy environments. And therefore, the model learned, OK, if it's a wolf, it's going to be in a snowy environment. Therefore, I just have to look for snow, and then I'll know it's a wolf. That makes no sense. And so really what this model ends up being is not a wolf or a husky classifier, it's really a snow detector. And so with interpretability, we can sort of see that, okay, this is what our neural net is learning. It's not learning the thing we want to learn. And that leads to the last idea I care about, is this idea of contestability. Because right now, these like, statistical algorithms, they're in our society, and they sort of have this like, magical veneer to them. It's like, oh, it's an algorithm, it's unbiased, it's an objective thing, it can't be wrong. That's not true at all. These algorithms can be completely wrong. 
and we should be able to dispute them. We should be able to say, like, I don't think this algorithm works. I don't think we should be evaluating teachers based on their students' performance on S uh, standardized test scores because of this bias and so-and-so. And so and so if we don't know what the model is doing, you can't really dispute it. It's sort of like if you see, re see a really outlandish scientific paper claim, you can't dispute it unless you know the methodology behind it. And so one of the key things I think will be really useful if we have more explainable models is that we can sort of say, like, oh, I don't think this is the right metric to use, or I don't think this variable is the right thing to use. For example, it's like, oh, we want to say, does a person, should a person get a job or not? And we use one thing that, like, oh, we're going to use their Myers-Briggs type indicator. It's like, do they, will they be good for this job? Well, Myers-Briggs has a lot of problems with it. And if we, if we know that the model is using Myers-Briggs, we can say, no, don't use Myers-Briggs. This is a very bad thing. This is basically just like Hogwarts houses for people with LinkedIn. <laughs> And most importantly, I guess there's this really cool thing, well, not cool thing, but like the European Union put out this thing called GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations. You might remember back in April and May, you received a lot of emails that are like, we updated our terms and services. Uh, that's because of GDPR. And I guess like there are two big articles about GDPR that we care about, which turns to like data interpretability and model interpretability. One, Article 22 says that any EU citizen can opt out of automated decision making. Basically, if there is a model that's basically deciding if they get a loan or not, the European uh, EU citizen has the option to say, like, I don't want this algorithm processing my information. They can opt out of that. And the second thing is that Article 12 says that individuals are allowed to ask about why the model made a decision for them. If they don't get a loan, they're able to ask, why did this model I did I not get a loan? And so this is a huge issue, because like right now, these companies are really using like random forests and neural networks. I guess these are two big things that are very popular in machine learning, high accuracy, low explainability. And so if you use a neural net, you can't really explain to that customer why they didn't get a loan, because you don't understand what it's doing. So thanks to GD, uh, GDPR, you basically can't use neural networks in the EU. So like, yeah, GDPR is going to save us from the neural networks. And so. This first algorithm I'm going to talk about is called Lime. And this was published in like 2016 by these three researchers at University of Washington. If you've ever heard of a company called Datto or Turi, it's like acquired by Apple recently, uh, Carlos Question is one of the co-founders. And so Lime is like sort of the de facto tool for model interpretability right now. It works with any model. Uh, that's for the model agnostic part. And it basically comes up with explanations of like, why did you do something for a particular data point? So first, let's talk, take a step back and talk about interpretable models. So what really defines an interpretable model? What models are usually interpretable? Well, these are usually linear models or quasi-linear models. So linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, models that really just make lines. We like lines. From both statistics and dance, we like lines. You know, linear regression is easy to understand. X goes up, Y goes up. X goes down, Y goes down. We as humans can understand that pretty easily. I guess the same thing with decision trees. They're sort of like quasi-linear in the sense that you can just start at the root, and you can follow the tree down, each branch by branch. You can see why I got this prediction. So you can look at this tree and say, OK, yes, you were coughing. Yes, you have a fever. You have a 90% chance of catching, I don't know, polka rust. And we can easily understand that. You can look at this picture. You don't have to know anything about like, really what the model's doing. You can just look at this picture and say, OK, you understand how the model is making its decision. And so these models are sort of globally interpretable. We understand that, like, if we make a change to the x, so if we change cough from no, yes to no, we understand how to traverse that tree. We know to go down the other branch. Or if in the linear regression, we know that if we increase this feature by like one unit, we can expect the y on average to increase by the coefficient. We know how to understand these things. And that's the globally interpretable. And so these models sort of have a like high interpretability, but they're not as accurate as, say, like the random forest or the neural networks. So how can we use them in terms of in, for interpretability? Well, we can use them as a surrogate model, or a sometimes known as a shadow model. And so how this works is you basically start with your black box model, and on some data set, you basically generate the predictions of the model. So you tab the data, you run it through the black box, you get the answers. And now you train a, a surrogate model. So this could be one of the models on the last thing. So let's say linear regression, for example. You take the data, and you train it on the data, and then the, and the, model, the black box's predictions as your Y, as your labels. And now the goal of this surrogate model is not to get like a ground truth, but it's more so to try and reverse engineer what the black box is doing, to try and approximate this with this simple method we can understand. 
Yeah, the random forest and the neural network is probably doing something much more complex than drawing a line of this goes up, this goes down. But the surrogate model will help us get some insight into what the black box is doing. And the idea is that if the surrogate model is sort of like well fit, or has high accuracy, then it sort of reverse engineered the decision making of the black box well. And that's how we can use it at like a global level to get some general idea of what our black box is doing. Of like, okay, if we increase x in our surrogate model, then we see y increased by this. The, the black box is doing something similar in between, inside its like inner complications. Inner machinations, that's the phrase I'm looking for. And I guess with these surrogate models, we sort of get this general estimate of like the global effects. You get this near approximation of the average effects of your black box. So, so sort of like global interpretability. But rather than caring about the global, like the average effect of all the features, we perhaps we can only care about like why the model came to a particular decision. So why did it not get that one person alone? Why did that happen? So this is local interpretability. So like interpretability for a specific data point, and this is sort of what Lime allows us to address. And Lime allows us to create like a explanation for a single point for pretty much any model. So it can be random forest, it can be neural networks. There are like plenty of other black box models like Gaussian processes, but no one really uses those. Well, people do, but not as much as the first two I mentioned. And so how does Lime work? Well, you basically have the point you want to explain. And then you get the model's prediction for it. But now, OK, you can't really fit a surrogate model to that one point. You know, n equals 1 is not a, data, is not a sufficient statistic. So we need to create new points about that one point. And so the way you do that is sort of you perturb it. You sort of add some noise to it. So we're going to increase this one column by like 0.01. We're going to decrease this other column by 0.01. And see what the model predicts for these new points. So we sample a bunch of points around it. And then we basically fit a linear regression to it, a weighted linear regression, based on how far you are from our point, and then also what your label was. And so to give an example how this works, so let's say we have this picture here of this frog holding this heart. I have no idea why it exists, but I love it. <laughs> And we're going to perturb it a bit. We're going to sort of gray out some of the pixels of the image. And so we can generate these three new images of the frog. And we want to say, what do we think? We run this through the classifier. Like, do, what probability is this a tree frog? What probability is this a tree frog? What probability is this a tree frog? And we can get some answer from the, uh, the model. And so we get these answers of the probabilities. We can fit a linear regression to it. And then from that, we can extract like, what are the most important parts of predicting this to be a tree frog. And so from here, we can say, OK, when we zoned out almost everything but still kept the head intact, we still say it's a tree frog with high probability. And therefore, that's like very important predictions of tree frog. And then once you get that weight, you can say that, OK, mostly the, the getting the head and the eyes is why we say this is a tree frog. So this is Lime, and this has like been around since 2016. It's sort of like the big popular tool that when people talk about model explainability, that's what they use. So Lime has some issues, and they're sort of, because it's using a surrogate model behind the scene, it's using linear regression behind the scene, it has the same, inherits the same problems as linear regression. So linear regression, OK, this is very bad for highly interactive data. It's also bad on heteroscedacity. Lime is also going to have that problem as well. If your data is like highly interactive, if you have like a 17-layer autoencoder going, um, Lime really can't capture all those like interaction between the terms. And so that's one weakness of Lime which is going to bring us to this cool new thing called Shapley Additive Explanations. And so this was like published like end of last year in December in 2017 by Scott Lumberg, uh, who's a very smart cookie, and a bunch of other people at U Washington. And this is a really cool way of thinking about model explainability. And so how this works is it has some roots in cooperative game theory. So for those of you who are not familiar, game theory is this like branch of math that basically deals with the interaction between decision-making engines. So you can think about two people competing against each other for resources. You usually talk about the two prisoners who have to rat each other out in the prisoner's dilemma. It could be nations competing against each other in like so, uh, political conflict. Or it could even be a woman competing against her boyfriend's mother, as in the movie Crazy Rich Asian, which came out two months ago, where the main character, if you've not seen this, the main character, Rachel Chu, she's an economics professor at NYU, and there's a scene where she basically uses game theory in order to sort of outwit or figure out like, how she can beat like, her boyfriend's mother who does not like her. It's a very fun movie. Anyways, so most of game theory usually talk about like, non cooperative game theory, like people trying to compete against each other. But there's a special branch of game theory called cooperative game theory, where it's basically people working together to achieve a common goal. It's like the mathematics of teamwork makes the dream work. And with regards to machine learning, 
how we can use this cooperative game theory stuff is that we're going to view the features of the model as the players. And the outcome of the model is essentially the game, uh, of the goal of the game. And the idea is that like, the features want to work together to get the right prediction. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. And so how this works is we're going to use something called Shapley values. And so Shapley values is sort of a way when you have a team, not everyone contributes equally. You know, when you have a team project, it's one person who does all the work. There's one person who does nothing at all. Maybe you've been the person who did all the work. Maybe you were the person who did none of the work at all. You know who you are. And the key idea of this is can we sort of measure what each person's contribution to team outcome is? And the heuristic that we're going to use with Shapley values is that if you remove that person from the team and the outcome doesn't change, then they weren't useful at all. Like, if we can remove this player from a team, a soccer team, and the team gets the same outcome, they weren't really useful at all. And the idea is that, OK, if we have this machine learning model and we remove this one feature from it, and the model still makes the same prediction, was that feature actually useful? And the way we use these Shapley values is that you sort of have to do this like weighted average. You basically iterate through all 2, n, 2 to the n possible combinations of your features and basically take the outcome where the feature is present or the player is present, subtract it against the outcome where the player is not present, and just sort of just weight that up. And so I guess first of all, because this is like a really cool formula, but if you think about this, this is like 2 to the n. This is going to explode mathematically. And uh, the economists don't care because they're like mathematicians, and mathematicians don't care about runtime. But if you try to do like an O to the 2n algorithm you know, from basic computer science, that's like a bad thing to do. That's just going to explode as n becomes like not even super large. It's just like n equals 100. This is going to be a super long computation. So when we do this in practice, we sort of have to do approximate these things. <laughs> And so this is what TreeShap is. So TreeShap is sort of an integration of these Shapley additive values, and it's integrated with XGBoost. So if you've not heard of XGBoost, it's like a gradient boosting tree algorithm. Um, I don't know if it's true now, but I know like a couple years ago, there's these like Kaggle competitions or these data science competitions, and there's like a joke meme that like if you just want to meme, just uh, if you just want to win, all you have to do is just submit like a horribly grotesque XGBoosted tree. XGBoost your way to the top. Anyways, so like I said, like. Brute forcing all 2n features is sort of common, uh, inefficient. So what TreeShap does is sort of uses the, decision, the structure of trees to quickly approximate the values of the Shapley values. And the way this works is it realizes, OK, rather than trying out all these 2 to the n combinations, you realize that some of these combinations are like subsets and supersets of each other. And use that information in order to speed up the calculations. And so I guess like when you think back to your like intro to computer science class, they taught you, OK, this is Fibonacci. Here's a recursive way, the naive recursive way to calculate Fibonacci. That's O to the 2n. It's terrible because it's going to do all these excess computations. And the trick in order to speed this up is to memorize the computations you did before. And this is the same thing here, where it's OK. And when you, if you want to do these four combinations of OK, age, education, marital status versus age, education, marital status, occupation, well, instead of just calculating this and throwing it out, we're going to have to reuse age, education, marital status again when you want to do this difference right here. So rather than having to recompute that again, you can just store that. And you can also reuse these when you need to build sets off these or subsets off these. And so it's a smart way to sort of like construct these and not do like the brute force 2 to the n approach. And there's a Python library for this. Uh, um, here, like uh, Slenberg uh, at the author's like GitHub, he has the, uh, an open source library for this. And so how does this work? So here we got some data on, like, um, it's a census data, and we we're trying to predict whether someone makes more than 50,000 a year or less than 50,000 a year. This is a very common data set when you're talking about interpretability and fairness. It's sort of like the iris of, like, the fairness and equality in the machine learning stuff. And so you have this data set, you have these features, and we have this first row, and we, we want to figure out, like, uh, why did we say that this is um, because it gets a label of guess? So this person does not, the first row does not make more than 50,000 a year. And we want to know why. And so we train a, a gradient boosted tree. And we can feed it through this Shapley explainer. And it can produce this visualization for us. And this is like a nice visualization showing us like what it looked into like making this decision for this one data point, for this first person here. And so, so the red is basically saying the like, things that work for you. And blue is basically all the things you have against you. So this person, OK, they had education 13, so they're college educated. They're also 39 years old. So OK, that's like reason to believe that they would make more than 50,000 a year. They have a good college education. They're also older. And you know, being older means you're far more along in your career. Therefore, we expect you to make 50, 000, more than 50,000 a year. Now, why would you expect them to make less than 50,000 a year? Well, you have all these features against you. So relationship being zero, um, I think that's maybe just being single. 
um, which makes sense because if you're not married, you don't have the joint uh, income. And then also other things like small capital gains. And so this is basically showing you all the things we believe for this one point, what we had working against you versus all the things you had working for you. And this is also really fast if you do this with XGBoost. Like, like I said, it's sort of integrated with XGBoost. You can run this explainer on like a scikit-learn random forest classifier tree, but it's also really slow when you do that because it then, like with integrated with XGBoost, it's sort of doing that smart computation I was talking about, whereas if you do it with like random forest, it's going to be slow. And so also, we have this idea of this deep explainer. So like, yeah, it works really great with like XGBoosted trees, we could still use Shapley values in order to figure out like what a deep neural network is doing. Because you know, all these methods now have to deal with deep neural networks, because that's like all the cool kids are using to these days. And so uh, with the with when trying to explain a neur uh, how a neural network is doing, what SHAP does, it combines the ideas of the Shapley values with other neural network specific um, methodologies. So most of these like neural network specific ones sort of use the idea of gradients because you know all the neural network is doing is like auto different um, back propagation, auto differentiation. It's just like a smart way to say like, calculus one. And so it basically combines the ideas of the Shapley add value with the way that the like, basically these back propagation way the ways of understanding what the neural network is doing and create this deep explainer. And it also has to use the entire data set as sort of like a baseline distribution for each label. So with like Lime, you just have to look at that one point in isolation. With the deep explainer, you sort of need to use the rest of the data set, sort of as like the baseline of what the labels should be. So like if the data set is filled with meerkats, we sort of want that to be the baseline. Okay, like 90% of the data is meerkats, and then we want to move up and move down from that baseline. And so here's an example of how this works. Um, so you have this picture of a meerkat right here. And it's basically all the things in red. It's like, here's, we have more reason. Like, these are what really makes us a meerkat. Like, we really believe this is a meerkat because of these fake base pixels right here. And this is like, because of these face pixels, if we change those, we don't think this is a meerkat anymore. The algorithm doesn't think it's a meerkat. On the other hand, you can also compare it against other labels. So, like, this picture of a meerkat, what would we think of it makes us a mongoose? And we can see here, that, like, with this prediction, the blue basically says why we don't think it's a mongoose. And so it's like, if we change those pixels there, we still get the same prediction of like not being a mongoose kind of thing. And so lastly, I want to talk about this idea of recourse analysis. So this is a really cool topic. Like this came out, this paper was like published like two weeks ago. So this is like brand new stuff. When I submitted this proposal to Pi Gotham, this was not even in here. Uh, so unfortunately, because this is like a last minute edition, I don't really have the time I want to do this like full justice, but I think it's a really cool idea that extends off this idea of interpretability. So interpretability, I guess like we've talked about now like how can you understand what an algorithm is doing, but this action may not be really, this explanation may not be actionable. You understand why you didn't get a bank loan, but what can you do about it? And so the idea of recourse is that if you have an individual who got a negative outcome, like they were denied a bank loan or they were denied parole, what actions could they take to improve their outcome? What actions could they do to challenge their fate? And I guess this ties back to what the, uh, also to back to the keynote I was talking about. Like, we don't, people want to be in control of their own destinies. They want to be able to be count, they want to be able to take charge of their own action. I think this is a really cool idea of recourse because like I was talking before, okay, we, we have this idea of the algorithms being this like faceless arbitrary of your judgment. And now with recourse, we can tell you what you need to do in order to get a better outcome. So you've gone from the, this faceless arbiter of your destiny to this like, cool way of this mediator of like your destiny. He's like, okay, here's what you, all the things you need to do in order to get a bank loan. Here's all the things you need to do in order to get parole. And I guess we, since this is like a new paper and this is like still like in its early stages, this really only works for linear models right now. And the goal is to essentially prove this flip set for an individual. Basically, you have the individual, they have some features X, and they, from the model, they got this outcome negative one. They, they didn't get the loan, they didn't get parole. Uh, or the teacher, they got a poor evaluation score and they get fired. And we want to know, is there some action that they can take such that once they take this action, that they get the good outcome. They get that loan, they get a parole, or the teacher doesn't get fired. And what we can show is that like, when you have a linear model, we can basically use integer optimization. This is basically just a fancy word for like matrix calculus stuff. But we can use this stuff and you can basically generate a flip set of like all the actions you need to take in order to, or a set of actions you need to take in order to change your outcome. And so the idea is like with this uh, optimization, we want to choose the cheapest options possible. So the easiest things you can do in order to change your outcome. 
And this is what this flip set generates. So this is a person who was denied a loan. Here's all the actions they can take in order to get that loan. And so the thing we need to be careful about this is we need to really specify what actions are really changeable. Because yeah, like having children is a feature that people can change. But you know, if you have kids and the you don't want algorithms saying, OK, you really want that loan? Just get rid of your kids. Um, that's a really bad outcome, unless you're Thanos and you're willing to do that, things like that. And so I guess, in summary, um, interpretability better helps us understand the behavior of our models for both like social good and social justice aspects to better be able to build more robust models. And I guess the big topic we usually care about is Lime. Lime works by building this local surrogate of a, of based on a specific input point. And I guess SHAP really uses game theory to create consistent methods for identifying features. And so this idea of consistency is important. Because like, yeah, random forest, if you use it in scikit-learn, has this like, feature importance thing. But that actually has like, three ways of it can be calculated. And if you use, compare all three methods, you can end up with three different results of like, what are the most important features, which makes no sense. And I think the SHAP explanation of like, what con defines consistent is most in line with what we intuitively consider to be the most important feature. And lastly, there's this idea of recourse analysis. Like I said, this is a brand new topic. And there's like a hopefully be a, a beginning of like a new beginning for like this idea of fairness and accountability in machine learning of like what can you do, what can the individual do to improve their outcome. And so lastly, I have some resources for an individuals who are more interested in this topic. There's this book on interpretable machine learning. Uh, this is actually sort of the inspiration for this talk. Uh, there's some other cool resources. So this AI Now Institute, which I will give a shout out to, because they're right here. They were like a research lab uh, found out by uh, NYU. And they're actually doing a talk um, or seminar like two weeks from now about algorithmic uh, accountability and transparency. So tickets will go. They'll have some tickets on sale next week. So I thought I'd give them a shout out, because they do some really cool work. OK. Thank you.